Okay, welcome back to our last session for today. We will start with two members of the ERNW uh, and Troopers crew, Birk and Florian, who will present a few insights about security appliance internals and how we probably could mitigate or defend against attacks against our security appliances. Thanks. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, this is Birk, I'm Flo. Um, we are actually having a pretty offensive focus normally um, because we are from ERW Research and uh, normally this track is maybe from the content has supposed to be in an offensive track. Uh, now we're in the defense and management track because we thought that uh, we would try to come up with some uh, questions or some recommendations uh, that are based on our offensive research. So what we're trying to do with this presentation is uh, that we are going to give you an insight about vulnerabilities for security appliances, um, how security appliances, how the architecture and the design of security appliances normally is, um, and coming from that perspective with an offensive view on those uh, boxes, uh, we will be trying to derive some recommendations for you should you be in a position where you have to decide on buying an appliance or deciding on which appliance you're going to introduce into your network. Uh, so this is uh, the slide set about how you can reach us, uh, mainly via Twitter. You have our email addresses in the front. If you have any questions after the talk, just approach us uh, or write us an email. Uh, so the agenda for this talk is we're first going through the relevance of this research, which is pretty obvious, but nonetheless we want to state why the security of security appliances uh, is a critical thing. We will go through a high-level overview of the classic architecture and the design of security appliances, uh, which enables us to already derive some problems that naturally come with security appliances. We will then walk through uh, a few security issues that have been found in the past in security appliances, and we will also disclose new vulnerabilities uh, that have been undisclosed so far in, uh, apply in an appliance and in a component that is widely used uh, in appliances. After that, we are going uh, to have the key takeaways and recommendations that we are going to try to derive from uh, the offensive view on the system, uh, and then there will hopefully be time for questions and discussions. So the scope of this research is obviously appliances. Um, I looked up the, the appliance definition in Wikipedia. That's pretty interesting. Uh, it's specifically designed to provide a specific computing resource to you. So an appliance should have like a, a, a purpose, a very narrowed down purpose. Uh, and well, by the way, that's the definition of computer appliances. Uh, and the name appliance is basically derived uh, from um, home appliances uh, because they actually have a, a, a very closed uh, role or management. So you'll, you'll basically have no chance as a user to really interact fully with the system. You somehow get sandboxed and you just basically use the features. To what extent you just get sandboxed is depending on the, uh, on the appliance. We will focus on security appliances. There are like more appliances, classic mail appliances. We will just focus on the security, everything that has security in its appliance name. And as I said, we will derive some recommendations that you hopefully can use to get you started once you're in a position where you have to make an educated guess or uh, have to decide on uh, buying or uh, getting your hands on an appliance. So, um, We've been gathering a little bit of uh, um, slogans from vendors. This is specifically pretty interesting. So there is a vendor that had a booth on a conference. Yeah, I don't know what, what it was. It was Black Hat. On uh, Black Hat, we saw this. Um, it claims to have a pre-exploit detection, which is quite nice because the appliance basically claims that it can detect stuff before an exploit has even been built. So it's not a pre-exploitation feature, it's a pre-exploit detection, that's pretty nice. Uh, there's also like this uh, third generation security is not a match for today's fifth generation of cyber attacks, that's pretty interesting. I didn't get that there was like a first, second, third, fourth and fifth generation by now. But every year a new one. Every year probably a new one, yeah. Um, 
Exactly, and then we have this preemptive, that's like one sentence, I'm going to read it out loud. Preemptively block known and unknown malware exploits and zero-day threats with the unique multi-method prevention approach of traps, advanced endpoint protection from a single lightweight agent. That's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, I actually, yeah. <laughs> I actually have the, the sources right here. We, we don't have a source for this uh, black <coughs> picture right there. Uh, but for the other ones, it's Palo Alto and Checkpoint. So uh, just for reference, uh, this is basically marketing slogans from those. Um, yeah. So uh, relevance of this research. Uh, security appliances are normally core infrastructure to your infrastructure, right? They're like, uh, um, you place those boxes in, in uh, multiple networks. They get hooked up to multiple networks. So there's like trust relationships to all kinds of other networks. Basically, those boxes decide uh, on, on, on the security of your network. So if the box is deciding on who has to go where and who can go where, it's like a really critical element in your network. And also the process data that is going through those devices is critical. Uh, appliances that are looking into email traffic to find malware, uh, VPNs, firewalls, uh, proxy functionality, all that kind of stuff uh, is hooked into modern security appliances. So this is core infrastructure handling uh, uh, really important and really critical data. And as I said, appliances enforce the security in, in your environment, and that's why the security of security appliances is extremely important. I think, I mean, this is basically a no-brainer, but um, coming to the conclusions later, I think that there is like a stakeholder in this thing that maybe does not really understand that security of security appliances is extremely important. And it's not us, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> if you look at security appliances and the threats to it, we basically identify two threats to uh, general threats from a high level perspective that um, make uh, implementing security in those devices uh, extremely problematic. So the first one is time to market. So as we've seen, there's like a lot of marketing slogans out there. Uh, you need to have five generations of threats to have six generations anti-detection mechanisms. Uh, so this is really, really fast paced. Um, and uh, the reaction to new threats that are coming up needs to be fast. Uh, so this is like, um, so you on the one, one hand, you have like the problem that uh, time to market, that you have a lot of uh, um, other vendors on the market. You need to have this unique feature that is uh, actually detecting pre-exploits uh, before they even build. Um, pushing features gives you definitely a marketing advantage. And this is never good for security. Like having a fast-paced development and fast-paced pushing, rushing out features to the market is always bad for security. Uh, threat number two is the, clearly the complexity of those devices. We will see later when uh, Birg is talking about the architecture and the design of those things that this is not just a box doing one purpose as Wikipedia defined uh, computer appliances. It's this one box having uh, tons of uh, functionality and tons of complexity in it. So this is pretty natural. Um, they are dynamically analyzing malware in like one box. They have web UIs all over the place. You need to administer it. Uh, you have an administrator that must be able to, to uh, click through all of the features, uh, to um, expose stuff to certain management networks. Uh, we have appliances that are dealing with big data, which are doing big data analysis, machine learning on them to kind of derive countermeasures if they detect an anomaly. Um, and you're dealing with thousands thousands or millions of clients that are basically pushing uh, data through those devices. And as we all know, complexity kills. So coming from that perspective, this is a pretty bad combination. You have this need to rush features to the market. You have a lot of complexity that is coming from the features, basically. And you're having a device that is you in your core infrastructure and is providing services that are highly critical and highly security relevant. So when we always looking at those boxes, um, the architecture is pretty uh, interesting all the time. And we try to print like a, a really high level overview uh, of how those boxes usually looks like. Um, this picture actually is um, when I had the checkpoint right in front of me. So the kind of the ports were like mirrored for it. Um, basically what it does, it 
your box that usually have some some kind of internet connectivity to get updates or patches. Sometimes they are deeper in the network, so um, you don't have the connectivity there. But there's like different networks, um, and um, there's the interface uh, interfaces there um, to monitor your traffic or to analyze whatever goes through or to block it, like a usual firewall. Um, you also have like usually a management port there, so this is only for the management network. Um, but it's not always the case that you can't manage those applications um, only from the management port. Um, usually you can just um, set it to like um, other IP addresses can manage those applications. And then we have internally the daemons um, who takes the traffic to analyze it, to parse it, um, whatever takes it, and there's like always some databases on it. But this is like the really high level part of it. Uh, if you kind of look deeper into how the connections between daemons and uh, ports and stuff like um, appears to, uh, it rather looks like this. It's like from the last appliance we had, uh, in the default configuration setup, um, there was like 150 different listening ports on it. So you, uh, you gotta be aware that this is actually a possibility. Um, and those demons had uh, also different uh, stuff to do. So um, this is kind of what you always see on those boxes. You have like huge amounts of uh, trust relationships between. Uh, just imagine if you have a management UI, it also has to do some uh, config on the system, and um, it goes. Uh, it's pretty wide there. Um, from the high level uh, perspective, we derived some some vendor classes we encountered. Basically, because there's like we, we put it into two different uh, parts of vendors. There's like the the vendor um, who does everything on his own. Like he he really put work in it. Basically, when it uh, when the application started, um, he did everything on his own and tried to build the system. And a really good example for this is actually the the blue code system, where they have their own custom file system, their own custom bootloader, and um, also like everything there is like in the in the kernel. So in, in ring zero, so they have uh, built up a whole uh, a whole system on their own. Um, this is actually uh, like a nice um, thing to also look at. Timo from uh, uh, ENW plus then wrote a, a tool to read the file system, and you can also manipulate it uh, in some ways to uh, to see what's on this. But um, the other vendor class we kind of encounter is like the third party software vendor where they take. Um, an already existing um, base system, like usually a Unix system, Red Hat, um, Debian, and they put a lot of um, third-party software on it, um, which is usually open source. Sometimes um, they write parts of it on their own, and they may, um, they edit it and do some uh, and try to um, yeah uh, get their uh, own code into also those open to uh, open source tools. Those company, uh, components are usually um, a web server, so like the Apache you usually find on the system, or like little web server, they, all, uh, they only um, serve one uh, functionality um, to display data or anything like this, or like MySQL and Postgres SQL databases. Also, um, they can implement some core functionality um, from third-party software like SIP um, extraction, runtime environments. Uh, the last uh, application we looked at, uh, after they had a totally revamped to a new version, and now everything is in Java, basically. So the whole management system um, is now a huge Java stack, uh, which is running on the system. Also for log collection, and we will go into log collection a little bit later. When you um, encounter those different vendors, um, you have like pros and cons. If you do everything on your own, you basically have the full control and knowledge of your architecture. So you don't uh, need, uh, need depend de dependencies from others. And also the full knowledge of the written code. And what also comes with this uh, is like a huge barrier for researchers. So um, for example, the blue code file system, to read it, to manipulate it, um, we ha um, you had to develop your own driver to, to read data and to write data again. So this takes up a lot of space for research researchers to look for bugs. And um, you also don't need dependencies for patches. You, you don't have to wait for another vendor to implement a patch. Um, for, uh, you can just write it on, the, on your own. Um, the downside with this is like you, you hardly stay bleeding edge. 
with this, like the security mechanisms that get implemented in the past few years, um, the best example is like uh, the address, uh, um, address based layout randomization. Um, for example, for blue code, it's kind of hard when you, uh, when you build your own bootloader, when you write your own kernel system to implement those new security features when you have written it without this in mind. So you probably never really uh, going to implement it if it's not um, like on the CPU uh, already as a functionality. Also, the, the high entry barrier, um, you, you can think like, ah, no one's going to write those driver or um, to, uh, to, few, uh, to look at this, so you may let bugs through because you think like, okay, um, we may have time in the future to patch this, uh, even though it's not perfectly fine for me, but no one's going to see it anyway because like, it's kind of obscure. Also for features, you have to develop them on your own, so it's hard to stay on the market, like the, the time consumption. Um, yeah, you, you can't stay on top of that. And also like one big thing is like if your staff leaves your company, uh, who knows it? So there's probably a huge problem with knowledge transfer there. Third party software, um, you actually have less code base to take care of. You only written some parts of it, um, but the rest is like open source and it's may maybe well maintained and you don't have to patch or update or do something new there. You only have like your core functionality that you have to take care of. Um, also, you may get lucky and your third party projects are really uh, well maintained. Um, for an example, it was like we had an appliance, we used the Google Rapid Response, so the GRR. And that's from Google and it's well maintained, it's, uh, it's always updated and uh, usually the code looks kind of better. Um, this was actually possible, uh, this was used to uh, execute code on other systems to like give me this file from this, um, um, this PC to analyze it. And if you would guess like writing this all on your own um, kind of uh, can screw you really easily. And also like features, like newly features from, uh, from third party software can really easily uh, get clued together and uh, usually the technologies are um, well known because you have documentation from those third party software. Also the, 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 um, the negative side is like your third party will contain bugs. No matter what, um, you have to be aware of that. And also there's like could be a third party that uh, goes end of life at some point. What do you do then? Um, you have to replace the whole component with something else. Um, which also you, uh, makes bug <coughs> hunting much easier because um, you have source code and documentation available so you can understand it way faster than analyzing like a whole custom bootloader. Um, so yeah, that's like a, a pro for the researchers who try to hunt bugs. And also like patches, if you change something on your, uh, on your open source system, if there's like a new patch and you need to implement it, it may break, uh, break your whole system. All right, so now coming from the high-level overview and looking at how things work in the, the appliance uh, field, um, we are now going through some vulnerabilities that have been found in the past and that uh, we have identified lately. And we will go through those vulnerabilities and try to um, derive why are those vulnerabilities there and which components are they and can we come up with some uh, recommendations when looking at the big picture of those vulnerabilities in the appliances. So we will start with FireEye. Uh, FireEye uh, had a buffer overflow that was found by Felix Wilhelm in uh, 2015 um, and it was in the code that was analyzing malware samples which is like the core component, a critical core component and it was probably in an own implementation uh, of the FireEye code. Uh, there was, Felix identified uh, also a code execution through the analysis of zip archives. Uh, so he could launch a symlink attack to um, place a zip file and then override arbitrary files that gave him basically code execution. All of this is public and it has been uh, made public also by FireEye. There are the references down there so you can look up the technical details that FireEye is actually providing you. Another pretty interesting finding in that context is 
is a finding uh, by Andreas Dewald, uh, which is standing right there. Um, he last year found or identified um, that there, the network isolation on the FireEye is actually uh, pretty broken when it comes to isolating the malware samples that get in uh, that are in a dynamic analysis state from the core uh, uh, internal core network infrastructure of the FireEye. So the malware samples basically were able to talk to uh, um, interfaces uh, internally in the FireEye that should never have been reached by the malware samples that you put in your FireEye to analyze. So that's pretty interesting because looking at this, um, I mean, there's more. All of the vendors that we're going to show you, there's like way more than we just show you. We just picked out a few that are pretty, uh, that are representing their bug class uh, in a pretty good way. And when you, when it comes to bug classes, you can basically see three classes right here. The first class is an own implementation uh, that contains a bug. Then you have a third party library that contains a bug and you have a configuration issue. So that's basically the best practice via all over the place in all of the categories that are actually available. Uh, when it comes to Palo Alto, um, it pretty much looks very similar, which is interesting. So uh, in this case, uh, Tavis or Mandy from Project Zero found a stack-based buffer overflow, a stack buffer overflow uh, in 2016, classic buffer overflow. Um, and if he found it in a third-party component that was basically the web server uh, called AppWeb3, which is end of life since 2012. So um, Palo Alto was using a third-party component uh, that was end of life since at least four years at that point of time. Uh, in the same year, Felix found um, a buffer overflow in the username handling uh, of the device, which allows for remote code execution. And that also is uh, inside the an own implementation uh, of Palo Alto. So it's not a third party library or whatever. So that's the own code uh, that they're using that contains this buffer overflow. And um, lately, last year, uh, a remote code execution was identified that got also assigned a CVE that basically led to remote code execution by bypassing an authentication, um, creating arbitrary directories, having a command injection in the cron script, and that basically led uh, uh, to a remote code execution. And that is also basically in the own implementation uh, of the code of Palo Alto. So. Coming from that, you can basically identify that simple best practices when it comes to configuration, hardening of your configuration, uh, and code, I mean, buffer overflows. I, I, I had like someone arguing four years ago that buffer overflows are, will be dead in, in like a few years, and we still have problems like a username buffer overflow. Um, so this is pretty remarkable from my perspective when we're talking about a security appliance, right? Um, so these are findings that have already been made public. Uh, they are well known. Um, and I will hand over now to Birk, and we are starting off uh, uh, a few of the newer findings. Yeah, um, the last thing we looked at was the, the checkpoint uh, in our private research. And um, we found some interesting stuff in it. Um, but first, we started with, uh, with the usual first exposed uh, interface, that would be the SSL VPN. And the really first grab of it revealed like they're using some, some frameworks, like the, the send framework and PHP extensions. And um, the sending to the daemon is also well handled. And they didn't have a lot of um, um, yeah, attack surface there enabled. And interestingly, if you, if you think of it, it's like a really old component uh, in the checkpoint. So this, this part of it uh, probably exists for dozens of years, or when the checkpoint released, this was like maybe one of the first features. Um, but when, um, yeah, when, when thinking back about like rushing features plus complexity um, in your core infrastructure, this can maybe uh, hunt you back. So after the, the SSL VPN, we kind of looked at new features. And Palo, uh, the checkpoint actually introduced something like a mobile portal. So this was the idea that with your handheld or with your, um, 
with your PC, you can, uh, without gaining uh, the VPN connection inside the network, you could also um, get your mails or get uh, your calendar via a mobile portal. So you can just um, reach the checkpoint and you can log in and then you can um, do stuff there, uh, what you usually needed beforehand to have a, a VPN connection tunnel through. Um, after a few, uh, uh, the first thing I, I looked at was like the web mail, and this was kind of interesting. So how do they um, um, do the web mailing thing? And when I set it up, uh, the very first thing that occurred is like it's like the most trivial cross-site scripting um, bug I encountered. Um, it's like just getting the parameter and putting it into the output. Uh, hence, you can do some cross-site scripting attacks. Um, this happened twice. It's like exactly the same part. This time I had to escape it a bit. And uh, it was the exact same result. And this was just like low hanging fruits, um, which usually get, should have caught really early because it's just like getting a parameter and um, um, yeah, displaying it to the, the page without parsing it anyway. So um, those two cross-site scripting uh, problems, we've reported it and they fixed it. And um, but when you look at it again, it's like really a super classic um, web application uh, vulnerability. And this can uh, guess something like um, this indicator might be this might be an indicator for some missing quality assurance for this new feature. Or this feature was either pushed too fast, and someone thought, "Yeah, we're gonna up, uh, we're gonna uh, look at it later," and this never happened. Um, further, the the web mailing thing, um, Checkpoint actually uses Squirrel Mail, which is a third-party library. And when I saw it, I was googling a bit around and saw like the the Squirrel Mail is end of life since I think 2002. 13. I, I think 2013, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was the last uh, patch. Yeah, and then yeah. there was like just in the uh, in 2017 there was like a um, um, security patch, and I thought like um, maybe it's like an old version and I could abuse this. Actually, <coughs> this this apply um, this instance would have been uh, on an old state, but it wasn't using uh, sendmail where the uh, remote code execution appeared. So I kind of looked into this old software and. Um, this is some code part I found, and this is what actually um, attaching, uh, so when you write an email, you can attach files, and this is the code what takes um, part, uh, or what takes over when you attach um, some files to the, uh, to the email. And this, actually, the, the local name is completely attacker controlled, and the interesting part is it will open a file um, with your completely controlled uh, file name, hence the, the attack you can actually do. This is like the, the post request. Um, it's from, it's a PHP, PHP unserialized. And if you look at it, the only thing you have to do is like put some dots and slashes and then you have a path traversal. Hence you can leak any file on the, check, on the current checkpoint um, to send it to you. And why there's like a host in this post debug, because on the default, um, in default there's like, a, there's like some files in the temp directory which contain really interesting parts, and that's like the, the current cookie from every user, from the admin who is clicking on the management interface, and if you leak this, you most likely can uh, own the box if you have some kind of access to those uh, interfaces. <coughs> um, yeah, either management interface or like the, the mobile portal, um, you can log in there with the user credentials, or rather the, the cookie. Um, the attack scenario we just thought about, like we, have, we had a cross-site scripting before, so the idea is just like send mails um, with the um, with the cross-site scripting vulnerability, and take over the browser, um, send yourself an email because then you can do it, and you um, leak the temp uh, host DNS debug. You can extract the cookies, and then you probably have the profit when you can uh, reach those interfaces. <coughs> um, this was actually um, also fixed now in Checkpoint. And it was disclosed um, in uh, May, I think, and was also fixed then, just like uh, 20 days later. Um, they sent us a private patch if that's uh, sufficient. Um, but unfortunately, we also disclosed it to the Squirrel Mail, and they didn't fix it till yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, so to, I mean, to give you more insight on this, we, I think in the meantime, we wrote four mails to Squirrel Mail. 
Uh, we received one response, and then basically was the response to requesting the PGP key uh, to disclose the bug, and since then we have never heard of them. Uh, so if you somehow, I don't know, have some channels to squirrel mail, we would like to use them. Uh, I mean, they have the bug, there is no fix out there as, as far as we know. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is unfixed since. Uh, this is, we are aware that this is basically a full disclosure now. This is normally not uh, how we handle this process. Normally we are uh, um, friends of uh, responsible disclosure so far and uh, putting users at risk uh, is not what we want to, to clearly state this, but in this case, um, reaching uh, Squirrel Mail not for, uh, it's like eight months now or something like that, um, is not really tolerable from our side. Uh, we know that there has been a remote code execution in Squirrel Mail a few months or a year yeah. before it we found just, this bug. It was like uh, one or two months? Two, uh, one or two months it. before that. And it, yeah, yeah, it was and full disclosure exactly. and then they patched it. So exactly. So um, we are fully aware that this is a full disclosure now, um, but uh, to be honest, we don't see any other way into throwing this out to you uh, to force Squirrel Mail to at least put out some patches or at least have vendors like Checkpoint being aware of this issue so they can fix the vulnerability themselves at least, right? Um, okay, so the next part is uh, a SIEM appliance that we have been looking into. We cannot state the name uh, of the appliance. Um, but we can talk about the component that we attacked. And this component is called NX Log. And it's, uh, so obviously it's a third party vulnerability. So um, what we have or what we had uh, during this engagement is we had a classic SIEM appliance that was monitoring events and tracking vulnerabilities. Uh, it aggregated a lot of data and that data was mainly gathered uh, via the NX Log agents that were deployed on the systems. Um, we were invited to a black box penetration test for that appliance, so we had no credentials, we had just one IP address and that's it. And um, after uh, a little bit of reconnaissance, we found an SSL-enabled SSL port uh, that revealed some the, the, an X-Log functionality to us. So that was basically the port that the agents were talking to when they said, hello, I'm here, um, and uh, this is me, this is my IP address, yada, yada, yada. And via this port, there was a functionality exposed uh, that um, gave us a remote code execution on the uh, NX log instance. Uh, we are going to demonstrate this uh, remote code execution now. Uh, we cannot talk about the details because the problem is that in this case, the vendor patched the latest version, but uh, he is still working on backports for older versions. And we cannot for sure say uh, what the status of this backports is. We know for sure that in the new versions, they silently fixed this bug, uh, but they were not um, uh, telling us on how long they take uh, to backport the patches for the old version. So this is why we're holding back a little bit with the, the core information about this bug. Uh, if uh, they um, say that they backported all of the patches, um, then we will uh, write a detailed write-up on Insinuator so you can uh, enjoy, hopefully, a nice Metasploit module to exploit this functionality. So what we are going to do now is um, unplug my computer here. I'm going to hand over for the demo to... Ah, oh, yeah, I fucked it up. I can just press the button. Magic. Let's hope it doesn't yeah. screw me in. Uh, yeah. So basically, um, what we do have now here is on the right side, a listener. So I'm opening a port to, uh, um, to get a, um, a reverse shell back. And on the left side, there's like the, the script with everything in there. And <coughs> if I press it, it's like a live demo. I hope this works, so there's no video. Um, it does something, and stuff comes back. And if you look at it, it's like a full functioning shell uh, on, a, on a Linux system who um, does actually, uh, yeah, has uh, NX log enabled. That is kind of a good one, All right, so now this is going to take me forever to switch back to my monitor, I guess. Uh, bear with me. Uh, 
Yeah, clap, clap again, maybe. <laughs> uh, oh my God, what's happening? Uh, yeah, so actually, get <laughs> getting root shells is far more easy than uh, than setting up a projector. Obviously, um, let me see if I can uh, tell this thing. Give me a second. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, 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 nee. Should we start it here? Hast du es da? Muss schnell an. Okay, give me a second. We do this in parallel now, so uh, hopefully Birk's faster than me. I'm done. Yes. <laughs> I want to have no discussion about <laughs> Linux and Mac now, please, all right? Do, did you switch uh, it again? Yeah. Yeah. Ready for this. All right, thanks to the Mac. Uh, we will continue the presentation. Uh, there's some pop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do I do this? I just press the button. Just press right. the button. Right. <laughs> but, but actually, two times, then it gives you root. Two times, and it gives me root. Okay. Um, all right, so I saved about three minutes, I guess. That's very good. Uh, so looking at the, the vendors that possibly are in some way interacting with an XLog, we don't know if they're incorporating an XLog in their products, but we know for sure that there is some kind of, uh, uh, there is some interaction, which means that all of the projects that you see right here, which is just examples, the, 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 the list is way longer, um, that all of the products at least that are on here uh, at least have some kind of integration with an XLog, which means that if you encounter one of those technologies, is in the network somewhere, uh, there is also a high chance that you will find an NX log uh, in, in that environment. Uh, so, I mean, just to give you uh, uh, an insight on, on how widely this tool is actually used for log gathering, right? Okay, so uh, let's go to the key takeaways and the recommendations that we want to derive now. Um, if you are going to decide on an appliance, if you're going to uh, think about getting one of those devices, if you are going to do some threat modeling or whatever with those devices, we will have some guidelines or questions that you need to ask uh, to get a broader picture on the security of those security appliances. So one topic that you need to cover is how is the handling of disclosures and how is the vendor acting with the security community? Because from our perspective, this is pretty key to having a fast response time to security issues. So um, this, gives you an in this gives you information on how mature uh, security processes are on the vendor side. So if you ask questions like, do they have a dis responsible disclosure process and they don't even know what a responsible disclosure process is, that gives you at least the information that the security processes that they have stop on the inside of the company if they have any, right? So they are not exposed, there are no interfaces to the outside world, uh, which is a bit of a problem. Do they act, interact with the security community somehow? Is there bug bounties? Uh, do they sponsor CTF teams, for example, stuff like that? Are they getting involved? Are they talking on security conferences, for example? Uh, um, how do they treat their, the security researchers when they're submitting a bug? This is all stuff uh, that lets you know if the internal processes of the security uh, are exposed to the outside um, somehow. And also, do they provide information on security issues? Are they just stating this is a medium finding and it can lead to a denial of service in specific edge cases? Or are they saying it's a buffer overflow, it can be remotely exploited, you should patch pretty fast? I also one, one time saw in the changelog that improved security uh, on a remote code execution was also a viable uh, thing to tell the customers. Yeah, so the, the changelog had yeah. what, what, improved what it said, improved security. Yeah, it's a feature now. Um, yeah, when you as a customer have a security bug identified, how do you submit this bug? Is there like, uh, I don't know, a, a ticketing system where you can like put your bugs in? And is there a category for a security bug or will you file this as a normal bug? Uh, because this also states that once you interface with uh, um, their procedure to, to get 
external input into uh, the development process. Uh, this pretty much shows you uh, if they wrap this process to the outside world. So are you able to directly interact with the security process that then gets channeled into the right direction? Or are you just opening a bug and then there is something who is not necessarily a security expert who has to decide on if this is relevant or not? That's, that's uh, a huge difference. So the lack of uh, mature security processes can be an indicator for missing security considerations in general, which means uh, you need to ask for stuff like product security, uh, do they have a secure development life cycle, stuff like that. And even if you ask those questions and you don't get an answer, then the no answer is always an answer because the way they are communicating with you about those issues, even if they are saying, mm, I mean, there's a difference in saying uh, no, period, or if they're saying, I'm unsure, I will try to get into the documentation, I will come back to you later, yada, 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 depending on how they're interacting with you on those topics, gives you an insight on how they basically uh, uh, um, enforce security in their internal processes. So some other questions that you can are, are, have is, um, are they performing penetration tests and can you see the results? Probably not, right? But again, them saying no, there is a big difference than just saying no or giving you three or four arguments that, uh, or points that basically state, this is why we are not doing this. You cannot have the results. These are the reasons, but we can provide you whatever. So this is a big difference. Um, in addition, if you just keep asking those questions, even if for yourself you're not expecting an honest answer or whatever, you're just showing the vendor that you care for security and you are the customer. So if you're going to decide on those project, uh, products um, and you're not telling your vendors that this is something that uh, is maybe also a feature, uh, that they're not going to implement it because you're not asking for it, right? Uh, another question is, do they train their staff? Is there like something with which, uh, like, like uh, trainings for application security? Uh, do they uh, have uh, DevOps security stuff, secure design, secure architecture? How is their internal setup? Uh, how do they work? How is security basically implemented in the, in the processes? Um, and always ask for documentation, right? That's also a good thing. As I said, most probably they're going to deny you access to their internal gyras and you can see all of the tickets of the vulnerabilities. Probably you're not going to see them, but just communicating with them over this issue gives you more insight. Uh, what are the technologies that uh, are being used? Are they using memory safe programming languages, for example? Uh, do they introduce security frameworks? Uh, this is all something that gives you an insight on how they are thinking concerning security. And from that, you can derive, I'd say, a feeling uh, on which vendor is actually putting effort into this and which vendor is actually not putting effort into this. Um, are they implementing the functionality themselves? Uh, if so, how do they ensure that the code is, is secure? Is there something like a quality assurance process, especially for security, not just the normal bug hunting? Are they using third-party code? If so, uh, how do they maintain those components? Is there someone who is actually able to understand the, 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 the third-party code and is able to supply emergency patches, for example, when the component is end of life? How do they deal uh, with the fact that uh, those third party components ca can run out of uh, or be end of life. And what is the average time to patch for security issues? Are they saying we are going to patch security issues every three months and our normal uh, life cycle is six months for patches? Uh, do they even consider this? Is the, is the, if you're asking that question, are they coming up with a response that they actually plan for security fixes? They know how they do this. Is there some exceptions? What about very critical issues? Are they able to patch out of the line? Are they able to patch pretty quickly when there is something really serious? Uh, how does that work? A very interesting part right now is this part, because when we're from our perspective. Yeah, that's, and that's like the best, best slide. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope we don't have that much time for discussion on this, on this thing. So when it comes to the cloud and security, 
there's obviously a big bias and there's obviously like uh, like I don't know 500 people standing on that side 500 people on that side and then it clashes but in this case uh, it's a pretty interesting question because the cloud is not your infrastructure right um, so if a vendor is actually putting features from those boxes in your network into the cloud this basically is not your infrastructure anymore if something happens in that component in the cloud. So obviously this raises privacy and data protection issues, right? But that's the other side of the story. So, um, but if the box that you have in your network gets owned, there is someone in your network on a core component. So having features in the cloud actually reduces your attack surface. So Consider that malware samples get analyzed dynamically in the cloud and not on the device that you have in your rack. And as we saw with the bugs, there's like a lot of problems with uh, parsing and analyzing malware. Exactly. So if you're coming back to the fire example, for example, they were dynamically analyzing the malware on the system itself. So when you are able to, this is a huge attack surface because this is not simple to build. So once you're able to attack this, it raises your attack surface. If you're taking that feature out and you're putting it into the cloud and somebody pops a shell there because he's able to exploit the same mechanism, it is not your infrastructure, right? You don't have that problem because you don't have to take care of the device that is sitting in your network and is now hostile. So um, I have this disclaimer that I'm very sorry for saying something positive about the cloud and security context. But um, in this case, you really need to consider this. I mean, it obviously raises other questions, right? Because you need to take uh, the decision between data protection, uh, trust is an issue here, obviously, and security. But you, or you whoever, you, you, I mean, you will have to decide on uh, if it is uh, actually a good idea to reduce your attack surface by moving stuff to the cloud. So depending on what kind of data is analyzed there, I mean, think about if the mail is put into the cloud to be analyzed for attachments and then uh, uh, analyzed there, that could be an issue. But if they just extract the attachment that they define locally in your network as a possible threat, then this could be an option because it's just hopefully just malware that is going to the cloud and not the, I don't know, ERW pen test reports that we send out with encrypted zip files or whatever, right? So uh, this is uh, uh, um, a thing that you need to consider. Uh, I think that most of the vendors would never have this as a feature. They would never tell you, hey, and by the way, click yourself this cloud feature and pay this cloud feature because it reduces your attack surface because we're too stupid to make our job right on premise. Uh, but this is actually something you need to consider, right? So this is not what they're going to sell you as a feature, but actually, from my perspective, it is. So now we're coming to the conclusions. Um, security appliances are core infrastructure and must be secured in an appropriate way. That's a no-brainer, I think. Um, you kind of need to put pressure on the vendors to raise the bar a little bit more because in our opinion, vendors for security appliances that have security in their names are definitely not doing enough to ensure a secure handling and secure processing uh, of uh, the, the data that is on the devices or reaching those devices. So they have definitely have to catch up there, from our opinion. And you need to consider those aspects before making a decision. That's also a no-brainer, I know. But when we're going to pen tests for appliances, I would say 50% of the appliances are already bought. Yeah, that's production. Right? And what happens then is we have uh, this example for the SIEM appliance is the best example. So they actually already bought that appliance. It was already in use. They had to get their check mark uh, because they need to do a pen test. So they called us. We did the pen test. We got remote code execution unauthenticated on their system. So what are you going to do now? What they did is they had to risk accept it because it was already productive. So they accepted the risk that this thing was there. And hopefully the vendor is like uh, actually able to patch it which he was yeah. not because it was a third party proprietary module that was implemented. So they, so our customer needed to wait for 
their customer to wait for the third party supplier to patch this thing. And all they had could do in that sense was they could switch it off because it was already productive. They had to wait and risk accept. And that is a bad condition. So take care of these questions before you're making a decision. This is crucial. All right, so coming from that conclusion slide, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you.